media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is investigative reporter Spencer Fernando. You can find his articles at SpencerFernando.com. Welcome back to the show, Spencer. Good to be here. Do you think anything was accomplished when they held the Pipeline Summit in Ottawa on Sunday between the Prime Minister and the Premiers of Alberta and B.C.? Uh, no, it doesn't seem like it seemed like they accomplished anything at all. Uh, Trudeau obviously failed to convince Horgan to change his position, so looks like everyone's back at square one. I mean, the government's talking a bit about spending taxpayer money on the pipeline, which, uh, I mean, that's just an indictment of their, their policies overall, the fact that a private sector project may need taxpayer funding when other projects were approved without that. Not a good, not, not a good thing at all. Well, it would be seven billion dollars plus in private investment. Of course, uh, you know, Tra- or Kinder Morgan saying we don't want to expose our shareholders to a loss here. But who said anything was guaranteed when you're in private enterprise? Well, I think the issue is that they. Um, it's the uncertainty because they were told it was approved. So the company starts to do certain things when they say a project's, when a project's been approved for them. They start taking actions, they start spending money, they start construction, and people are counting on a project being finished. So if they get approved for a project and then the government still can't get it done, then why would a company want to be spending any money on that? And the problem is it's not just with Kinder Morgan because if this doesn't go through, then it's going to send a message to you know, out investors throughout the world and throughout the entire economy that even getting something approved through all the legal processes in Canada still doesn't mean the project will go through. And that's going to have a serious impact on the country. Well, this sounds, you know, what's happening with Kinder Morgan is almost what happened to Barrett Gold and Pasqua Lama, a big gold development on the Argentinian-Peru border where, you know, they had all these government assurance, assurances that it would go through, but all the locals stood up and they lost uh, hundreds of millions. Perhaps, although I think in this case, I mean, if you look at the polls, even the majority of people in B.C. in the latest polls um, are in support of it. It has strong support throughout the country. Now, uh, Horgan's just in a position where he's beholden to the Green Party. So if he approves it, then I think the Green Party will try to take him out, or he could lose his government, and he's... You know, he's really in a tough position, but his argument doesn't have the, the law on his side. I mean, the project's been approved. The federal government has the authority to approve the project, and, uh, you know, he's, he's still trying to fight it, but it's, it's not working out on his side, and Trudeau really needs to take some action. I mean, I know you're in BC, so you don't want to hear anything about the federal government threatening BC, but it's very interesting how Trudeau uh, says he's going to withhold $62 million from Saskatchewan because they don't want to impose his carbon tax. And yet he just gave uh, the BC NDP $4.1 billion for infrastructure, even as the, the government's opposing the pipeline. So a bit of a double standard on how Trudeau's treating people. Well, I'm from Alberta, and most of my family uh, is connected to the oil business in one way or another. Even if they're farmers, they have uh, land that's leased out to the oil companies. So I understand what's going on there and mm-hmm. why it's important. And, and also, why does the federal government... Uh, Keep not acting. That that's what I find very puzzling in this. Where clearly they do have the upper hand, and now they say they're going to pass more legislation proving they have the upper hand. But I haven't heard anything about it yet. Yeah, you know, I think it's. I think Trudeau really doesn't actually want it to be approved, but he just knows he can't say that. And you know, he he made comments I think a couple of years ago, and he said the. Uh, the oil sands should be phased out. So that's really his view. He wants the oil sands phased out. He wants to move on from the uh, the carbon economy, as people call it, even though people are going to be using oil for a very long time still ahead. 
And so I think he doesn't really want to prove it, but he, he, they need a way to make it look like they're trying to do something without actually doing something. You know, he doesn't want to lose votes, I think, in uh, downtown Vancouver. Um, and so he's he's trying to have it both ways. He's trying to make it look like he's doing something, but I think he's hoping that it will end up getting blocked before it gets passed. So I think it's really a lot of it's, uh, you know, it's um, it's kind of a big image he's trying to put on. He's trying to make it look like he cares, wants it to get passed, but in the back of his mind he's hoping it won't. So if he's torn, imagine what it's like for people here who know that uh, Canada is missing out on $40 million a day by not having this pipeline, and, and yet you don't want to see spills on the West Coast. People are also asking me, why don't they just uh, ship more of Alberta's oil out through Washington State? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I mean the problem is we, we should be able to get our own oil out throughout our own country. I mean, to say that that should go on the Americans, I think is a tough argument to make. Um, you know, pipelines have a, a pretty good safety record, especially compared to transporting it by rail. I mean, we all saw what's happened in the past with rail accidents. It's very serious. And, I mean, the safety record of pipelines is pretty good. You know, nothing's perfect, but Canada does have some of the toughest standards, maybe the toughest standards on Earth in terms of pipeline safety. Um, and, you know, at some point we're going to have to just decide, you know, are we a country that actually uses our resources or do we just leave it in the ground? I mean, there's people who say leave it in the ground. But what they don't realize is if you do that, that's way less money for infrastructure, way less money for health care, way less money to take care of seniors. Our, our country needs the money. We'll have more with Spencer Fernando right after the break. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome back. We're speaking with Spencer Fernando. Spencer, Alberta now has put up legislation that would allow them to cut off oil and gas shipments to British Columbia. British Columbia says they could sue. And to get a court injunction, you have to show the judge that you have suffered or will suffer some significant damage. He could ask for an injunction against Alberta to stop them from cutting off the oil right from the start, couldn't he? Oh, I think they'd have to show some sort of damage ahead of time. And that's what's ironic about this. So on the one hand, Horgan is saying, oh, it could damage us if we can't get the the oil from Alberta or the gas from Alberta. Okay, well, then why are you not letting Alberta put, uh, you know, benefit from a pipeline? I mean, you can't have it both ways. You can't demand that Alberta gives all the money or gives all the, the oil and uh, gas to B.C. and then not let Alberta benefit from that same resource. I mean, that's totally contradictory. And it's the same with uh, Quebec. A lot of the attitudes you see, not all in Quebec, but many in Quebec, where they constantly they oppose pipelines, they criticize Alberta for the so-called environmental impact of the industry, but then they keep taking all the transfer payments. They take the billions in transfer payments, that much of which is funded by Alberta. So it's very contradictory. Everyone seems to want to use the money that comes from Alberta and get their resources for themselves. But when Alberta and Canada, by extension, wants to benefit from that, everyone's like, oh, no, no, you can't do it. So, I mean, Horgan never really looks like a hypocrite. He, he can't uh, he can't demand that Alberta give him a bunch of resources and then stop their ability to profit from that. Well, we also have the, po- the hypocrisy of Quebec uh, opposing pipelines there, and yet they're taking Arab oil by tanker across the Atlantic to the... Atlantic provinces and processing it there, why not use Canadian oil, which would be cheaper? Exactly. And I think, you know, it's, you know, I've said it before, the rest of the world must look in Canada and just laugh to see a country with so many resources and how incompetent we are at managing them and, uh, you know, spreading them throughout our country. It's, it's completely insane that Canada has 
any imported oil anywhere. I mean, maybe from the states you could you could make an argument because the economy is so integrated. But to think that we're importing oil from all like halfway across the world—that's crazy. Also, uh, when we talk about legal action, I'm wondering if BC consumers could launch a class action suit against Alberta if they cut oil supplies. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure, but I think that'd be a pretty tough case to make. The problem with that is you're, we're just going to get into a bunch of countersuits because then you could easily say that, uh, you know, Alberta workers could launch a suit against BC for, you know, depriving them of their livelihood with a pipeline, right, and all the economic benefits. So this is the problem when the federal government doesn't show leadership is it just devolves into a war between the provinces. And, you know, if, if this is... You know, you think about it, Trudeau is right now in, I think he's in Paris or he's traveling to the UK right after his Paris trip. He just gave a speech where he talked about how important it was for us to have a free trade deal with Europe. So why does the Prime Minister over in Europe talk about free trade when there's obviously not even anything close to free trade within our own country? We have provinces that are acting as if they're totally separate countries, attacking each other, suing each other. In this case, Alberta's in the right, so it's, you know, I think the D.C. government that's wrong here. But we don't even have anything close to free trade in our own country. So why is Trudeau, outside of Canada, lecturing other countries about how important a free trade deal is when it's not even happening in our own, in, in our own country? What is it? It costs Canadians $43 billion a year because we don't have free interprovincial trade. I can't buy cheaper booze in Alberta and bring it to B.C. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's easier to get, uh, get uh, wine from, uh, you know, Europe and from California in some cases, and just to get it from right here in Canada. So uh, it's it's absurd. And not only are we losing all the money with the lack of trade between our own provinces, but in terms of oil, the discount, we're losing a ton of money uh, every year for the fact that we sell almost all of our oil to the U.S. They know that we're totally dependent on them, and so they, they get it way cheaper than it should be. So not only are we not getting as much oil out of the country, uh, selling as much out of the country as we should be. But even the oil we do sell is not selling for as much as it should. We'll have more with Spencer Fernando right after this. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Spencer Fernando. Spencer, what's your uh, feeling here or take on the national security advisor now telling us what really happened about this kerfuffle with the convicted terrorists being invited to dinner in India. Well, I mean, in many ways, it just raises more questions because he's now said that in the briefing he gave to reporters, he never said anything about rogue elements uh, within the Indian government. So if that's true, obviously Trudeau would have known that from the beginning. I mean, he's he's Trudeau's national security advisor, so he's not saying anything Trudeau wouldn't know. So that raises the question of why, when Trudeau was given numerous opportunities to say definitively yes or no, was there rogue elements in the Indian government, did he back up that theory, he refused to give a clear answer on it. So either he isn't actually being briefed by his national security advisor, which is a big problem, or he was briefed by him and he just chose not to explain something that would have been very simple to explain. And it's probably the second one, and he's probably... I uh, realized that he would have to take responsibility for his disaster trip if he couldn't blame it on a uh, shadowy conspiracy in India, and he just, he'd just rather blame somebody else for it. What does this uh, do for the conservatives? Have they just been ad, you know, handed uh, thousands, maybe millions of votes on a platter here? Yeah, I think it, well, it definitely helps them. I mean, there's been, if you look at the polls, they go up and down, but there's a pretty clear uh, and substantial decline after the India trip, and it has not reversed itself. And so I think we're seeing that uh, the trip definitely had a, a pretty clear change for, for a lot of people in the country. 
Um, I think Trudeau's image of someone who, you know, was seen by some Canadians, not really myself, but some Canadians as being effective on the world stage and representing Canada, I think that that image has really been wrecked. And so it definitely hurts Trudeau because I don't think anyone looks at him as an intellectual heavyweight, but I think people, some people see him as, oh, he's a nice, happy guy out in the world. He made a fool of himself, got caught lying a few times in India. So that hurt him. The question is, can the Conservatives capitalize? It's one thing for your opponent to lose support. It's another to actually gain support. So we'll see if the Conservatives can sustain uh, some of the increases they've seen recently. Does it say anything about Trudeau that he's off to Europe again right after this uh, summit on Sunday that accomplished nothing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he doesn't really care that much about Canada, to be honest. I think he's um, he, he wants to be... Uh, like an international figure, you know, a rock star, whatever it is, and he, Canada is kind of uh, is a stepping stone for him to get that attention. So he, he obviously seems to enjoy himself much more on the world stage. You know, the international press often seems to cover him well. Uh, they never give context of what he's doing. They never talk about what was happening in Canada, so he probably enjoys that. And he's, uh, you know, he's failing pretty miserably here. I mean, if you think about it, we have one of the most serious crises between not just the federal and the provincial governments, but between two provinces themselves. He should really be here full-time dealing with him. Instead, he's just heading off around the world doing photo ops and giving speeches to, like, a speech to the French National Assembly. Not really the top priority when Canada's got some serious problems. Do you think he's trying to avoid question, period? Oh, sure, for sure. Uh, quite, he doesn't really do too well in question period, um, and he would be doing very badly now because he would be having to answer some tough questions. Of course, he promised when he was running that he would be you know, open and accountable and transparent and show more in question period. So, you know, I think it's just more hypocrisy from him, and he's, yeah, he's definitely avoiding the tough part of his job and doing the part that he enjoys, which is just uh, giving speeches in foreign countries and getting photos taken. I mean, I can tell you as a person who does it, it's a lot easier to ask questions than to have to answer them, especially if you're yeah. supposed to answer them truthfully. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what they say. They call it question period, not answer period. Where do you think uh, Trudeau is going to end up here? A and is uh, Andrew Scheer sitting somewhere rubbing his hands in glee? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's kind of tough because, I mean, there's always, from the cynical aspect, uh, you know, it's, I think it's fun to see your opponent struggling. The problem is, in this case, especially with the pipeline, I mean, the struggle for Trudeau is also, uh, you know, bad for the country because it's, it's not good that it's not getting done. So I think it would be, you know, whether Trudeau would benefit politically if it got approved. Um, tough to tell. I think there's already a lot of criticism of the fact that it's been such a tough process and even if taxpayer money is spent on it, that's still going to not look good. For the prime minister, but I think everyone, you know, most people want to see, just see it get done. The, the challenge for the conservatives is that it's, it's one thing for your opponent to lose support, but it's another to get that support yourself. So, you know, we'll see if they can capitalize in the long term. I think if you look at what's happening in Ontario, it's interesting. Doug Ford is kind of releasing his policy, uh, you know, day by day at events. So I think the conservatives are probably waiting closer to the election, uh, to release more ideas, but, you know, there's probably a few things they want to start talking about. Their vision for the country, what Canada would look like if they were in charge. I think that's, that's helpful when your opponent starts to lose support. Well, it looks like Doug Ford has got a lot of traction just on one idea alone, and that's to stop charging provincial income tax on people who make minimum wage. Yeah, I think it's a great idea because it's, uh, it strikes a nice contrast between Kathleen Wynne's approach, which is always, you know, She'll talk about, she'll say that she's about caring for people, but if you really look at what she proposes, it's always more power for the government, right? She thinks that politicians and bureaucrats always need to make decisions for people. And Ford seems to be taking an approach that's about trusting people with their own money in the first place. I mean, you just don't take the money from people in the first place if they have more money in their pocket, as opposed to taking it and putting it into the bureaucracy, coming up with some complicated plan, and then trying to give it back to people later on. I mean, just, just better to let them keep it. Well, I've always wondered why anybody making under $25,000 a year should have to pay income tax of any kind. I mean, Alberta's personal exemption, I believe, is around 25000 B.C. It's 9000 
mm-hmm. a huge difference. When I when uh, Ujjal Desange was the NDP Premier of BC, I asked him, "Why don't you up the personal exemption for BC income tax to twenty five thousand, like Alberta?" And he said it would cost BC three billion dollars a year. And when I said, "Oh, so you admit you're running the government on the backs of the working poor?" He just walked away. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I probably didn't really want to answer that one. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's the problem. It's the government. And, you know, I, I find it funny. Uh, the, mm-hmm. after Doug Ford released his, his plan to exempt uh, minimum wage earners from the income tax, the liberals came back and said, oh, well, this is going to cost, uh, $500 million. Yeah, but that's assuming that it's the government's right to take the money in the first place. I mean, you could, you could easily say, the government is costing taxpayers five hundred million dollars dollars a year by taking their money, uh, minimum wage earners by taking their money. So it, it's very interesting, kind of the word games people play with it. It's like, oh, the government's being deprived of revenue. Well, the government only gets that revenue by depriving taxpayers of it in the first place. Well, the uh, chief medical health officer for British Columbia, Dr. Perry Kendall, told me the biggest cause of poor health in Canada is poverty. So obviously, if people get good nutrition and can afford a gym membership or something like that, they're going to be healthier and in the long run cost the government less. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think uh, one of the biggest problems is the uh, the school system, really. I mean, I think there should be, there's kind of a declining um, focus on uh, physical health in schools, which is a big problem because it's it's been shown repeatedly that if people don't, uh, develop good habits when they're young, then uh, they're not going to. They're going to be much healthy, much less healthy when they get older. And I think there is a kind of an aspect of poverty and health that does go together. I mean, it's if people are in bad health, it's often tougher to you know work consistently or make more money. I mean, there's a cost to not being healthy, and so it can kind of reinforce itself. You know, someone may have a lot of health problems; they can't get the help they need. It's tougher for them to make money, and then the lack of money makes it tougher to afford good habits. And then you see people get in you know, even worse situations. So, yeah, I think if, the sooner we can start teaching both physical and, uh, um, you know, financial uh, good advice in schools, I think would be beneficial. And that's I think that's a deeper problem with our whole society. I mean, you look at the pharmaceutical industry. That whole industry is based on the idea that you let people get really unhealthy and then you fix one little problem with a really expensive pill and then that problem... That pill causes another problem, so you give them another drug to fix that problem, and there you go, you're making billions of dollars off a lot of unhealthy people instead of saying, maybe we should get health right early and, you know, find the root causes of the health problems and then save money that way. So I think that's, especially in the Western world, that's a big issue we're going to have to confront our approach to health and healthcare. Spencer, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, no problem. My guest has been investigative reporter Spencer Fernando. You can find his articles at spencerfernando.com. You're listening to the Goddard Report on talkdigitalnetwork.com. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and talkdigitalnetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.